Welcome back, everyone. Peter Maravellis here. This is the fifth session of today's Media and Us Symposium Workshop. The name of this session is titled Digital Literacy and Advertising, and we will feature Nicholas Baham III, Ben Boyington, Andy Lee Roth, Nolan Higdon, and Raina Robinson. As is customary before each session, I'd like to acknowledge that we are beaming to you from the unceded ancestral grounds of the Ohlone peoples, also known as the San Francisco Bay Area. I would like to take this moment to honor those who have come before us as stewards of the land. A word about our participants for this session. Nicholas Bayham III is professor and chair in the Department of Ethnic Studies at California State University in East Bay. He is the author of the book, The Coltrane Church, Apostles of Sound, Agents of Social Justice. Ben Boyington is an advocate for integrating critical media literacy into K-12 schools, a high school educator and member of the Media Freedom Foundation Board and former vice president of the Action Coalition for Media Education. Andy Lee Roth is the Associate Director of Project Censored and co-editor of 13 editions of the project's yearbook. Nolan Higdon is an author and university lecturer of history and media studies and is a founding member of the Critical Media Literacy Conference of the Americas. He sits on the board of the Action Coalition for Media Education. And also Raina Robinson is with us again. This is coordinator of services for San Francisco Bay Area Justice involved youth since 2016. Is also a certified community resiliency model and youth mental health first aid instructor amongst serving the community in many other ways. We have posted more extensive bios for our authors and the City Lights website. We're going to be including links to those in the chat function as we have throughout the course of the day, uh, as well as links on how to learn more about Project Censored, the Media Revolution Collective, as well as how to purchase copies of the Media in Me, which is that wonderful book that this symposium is based upon. As always, the sessions are intended to be interactive, so we do encourage all of you to communicate with each other and ourselves and the session leaders via the chat function of your Zoom dashboard. So I'd also like to remind everyone, uh, today's sessions will be posted on YouTube. So if you miss anything, you'll be able to go back and view it at your leisure. So please join us now in welcoming our session leaders. Welcome to session five of Media and Us. Good to see you all. Thanks so much, Peter. Uh, this session is focused on digital literacy and advertising. And uh, as, as it's addressed in The Media and Me, A Guide to Critical Media Literacy for Young People, published by the Censored Press and our partners at Seven Stories Press. And I think what we'll do just to uh, get this session going is do um, exactly what we've done uh, earlier in the day. I will just go around and ask each of our present panelists to say a little bit about the uh, a first pass at these themes of digital literacy and advertising, and then we will um, maybe go round again, um, a, and then we'll open it up for um, more of the great kind of dialogue that we've been having all day long with uh, you all who are here and participating. So um, without, oh, and yes, thanks, Mickey, for that notice. Uh, uh, Nolan Higdon, who is one of our co-authors and definitely someone who uh, is an uh, uh, insightful commentator on uh, digital literacies, um, is, uh, has been unable to join us today because he's been uh, traveling. Um, um, so, um, but, uh, so on my screen, I think I'm going to jump over and uh, Raina, do you want to have a first opening uh, set of remarks on on these themes of of digital literacies and or advertising? Sure. Yes. Yeah. So um, I, I can definitely speak to um, digital literacies as it relates to my work as a juvenile justice educator um, as a part of my um, my master's program. Um, I was really, um, I was extremely honored to have uh, professors that uh, took interest in my work and the things that I were interested in and really helped guide, uh, provide me tools and guide me to uh, be able to create things that I could actually put into practice in my profession. Uh, one of which being um, a digital and social media literacy guide. 
Um, and the um, and what I really focused on with the guide was that I felt that it was um, it was a critical aspect. Of, excuse me, digital and social media literacy was a critical aspect of uh, urban youth success. Um, and I specifically um, developed a um, educator's guide that was um, that I felt was um, developed for um, alternative education. Uh, so that as youth who are um, in, uh, um, we call them community schools, maybe they've been expelled from school, um, alternative or continuation schools, as well as what we call court schools, which are the schools that are um, located within uh, juvenile facilities. Um, and where while there was a lot of different material um, that I could have used to, um, to facilitate um, an understanding of digital literacy, um, I felt that um, there was a huge social and um, and cultural lens that was missing for youth who have um, those, um, uh, first of all, youth who struggled with education, being those um, in those um, school settings that I named. Um, and then secondly, not having um, examples or not having um, concepts or ideas that um, I felt reflected where the youth that I served were in their lives, um, meaning uh, some of the experiences, uh, events, and um, um, challenges that they, they may face as a part of uh, being a young person um, in their current communities. Uh, so uh, this guide was really developed with, um, like I said, that population in mind, um, but um, it covered, it covered, um, concepts of developing critical um, critical thinking skills, um, understanding how media messages shape our culture and society. Sorry, I'm trying to read notes at the same time. Um, uh, um, it also offered young people a way to identify target marketing strategies um, and recognize bias, misinformation and fake news. Um, and what um, we, we probably would think would is also some of the most important is how to advocate uh, using these tools for positive change um, and ways that they can create and engage um, in social media um, for uh, for good or to create um, a um, a more pleasant, a desirable life for themselves. Um, so the guide really, um, like I said, I I um, I used it as a as a tool for dialogue critical questioning and thinking um, with young people. And it was really project-based. Uh, so we did a lot of different, uh, the units were based on uh, what is the internet. So that was our first, uh, our first unit. And the hope was that young people um, got an understanding of um, someone touched on earlier um, that Google isn't the only way to find information, um, ways to, um, to search online. Um, and really holding, honing in on some of those different research techniques. Uh, the second unit, uh, we talked about digital footprint. And for young people who are um, coming from um, many challenging or adverse um, childhood experiences, um, how they could use um, digital media through an Afrofuturist lens um, to essentially create um, more desirable lives for themselves and really understanding um, that um, the, the, um, the uh, implications of the way that they interact with uh, social media, how it could have an effect um, on their futures and, and really allowing them to um, be more uh, change agents and have more agency in that. Um, so the third unit we focused on um, um, discovering what is social media um, how social media can be used, um, what are ways um, that social media uh, has not been used yet, like challenging young people to find creative and innovative ways to use so social media. Um, and, and then also a lot of that uh, self-awareness and self-discovery and um, in why they engage in social media. Um, what do they notice about uh, their patterns of engagement and, um, and how they can learn about themselves? Let's see, and then unit four, um, social media literacy, why it's important and, um, and making sure that they are understanding that 
the goal of um, me as an educator is to um, ensure that there is no harm, um, that they're not causing additional harm, whether that be to their physical or, or mental health. Um, and when I say physical, um, I did uh, also did a research paper that talked about um, the, um, the phenomenon of, of youth violence in the intersection of and the use of digital um, media. Um, so that also we touch on that as well. And, um, and then the last, um, which is very similar to and why I'm so happy to be a part of the media and me, um, the last um, unit five is about um, engagement with us with the digital media. So what we would call netiquette, um, and also ways to advocate for yourself and use social media for good. Um, so um, as a ju juvenile justice educator, I've seen um, critical digital media literacy not only um, being a, um, a tool for, um, for, for critical thinking, but also um, a tool for, um, to, um, for living and, and learning and being able to, like I said, put on that um, your Afrofuturist lens and create the life that you feel you deserve. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Raina. That's wonderful. I'm so glad you mentioned that notion of a digital footprint and the idea that whenever we're using media, um, we're leaving these, these tracks for better or worse. And I think that that ties in. So the idea of doing that with an awareness that that's what's happening with uh, and, and helping young people to understand that digital footprint that they're creating of themselves for themselves ties back to things that uh, Kate Horgan and Maria Cecilia Soto were saying this morning about uh, media and the creation of identity, right, as a project. Um, so important. And your work has been a truly inspiring um, uh, to me personally. So thank you. Um, Turning to Ben, uh, uh, again, a first pass, and we'll probably come around again, um, notions of digital literacy and advertising, Ben. Um, first of all, Raina, I mean, wow. <laughs> I think that's just <laughs> awesome. I'm, I'm over here stunned by the whole thing. So thank you for the work you're doing. I'm really, I'm, I'm fascinated and moved by, by the stuff you talked about. So start there. Um, I'm gonna spin off the why they engage in social media comment that you made about getting students to, to think about that, young people to think about that. Um, I think this is that, you know, this is ties all together with the idea of the attention economy, which um, has recently sort of popularized by uh, Tim Wu. Um, it's, it's almost a truism at this point to say that these devices that we have, these smartphones are designed to, to suck us in. Um, Tim Wu would say they're designed to steal our attention. And it's not just the platforms that exist on them, but it's the very devices themselves, right? Um, the notifications process, for lack of a better term, is, is something that we get. And it's amazing, you know, I sit and I talk with my kids um, who are 18 and 16 at this point, I talk with, uh, translated as argue with, um, about their use of screen time. And I'm guilty too, you know, like I've gotten sucked in and, and I say, you know, it's not your fault. Like, I'm not blaming you for doing this. I'm suggesting to you that you need to think about what it's doing to you. And yeah, I was in a classroom, I would be <laughs> a little less didactic and a little more questioning to get them to think. But, you know, that idea of the devices being built to suck us in and the platforms being built to kind of, uh, I don't think addiction is the wrong word here. Um, it's its a problem. I mean, specifically, it's a mental health problem. Um, it's, a, it's a use of time problem. It's the reality that so many of us now, and again, I'm guilty of this too, are not comfortable being alone with our own thoughts. Uh, a lot of our youth don't know how to be alone with their own thoughts, right? Out of boredom comes creativity, out of boredom comes innovation. Um, it all kind of ties together. And then when I couple that with this idea of, of advertising um, and advertising being kind of founded on making us feel bad about ourselves, you know, this, this entire idea of um, the production of discontent as, as Bernard McGrain uh, said many years ago in a, in a movie, a documentary called The Ad and the Ego, uh, late 97, I think. Um, with production of discontent, the idea that there's there's something wrong with you. And if you just buy this product, it'll be better, your flaws will be fixed, whatever they are. It might be an acne medicine, it might, but it doesn't matter what it is. And the other piece that kind of the under principle that, that, that we write about in the book is this idea of um, emotional transfer, right? An idea that 
the, the story being told in the ad makes you feel a certain thing. And then whoop, there's the brand. Okay, the brand makes you feel that thing, right? It ties it all together. So when I start thinking about how all that fits and why why this is an issue for digital literacy is that, you know, we're, we're, whether it's advertising, whether it's the addictive nature of the device, both of those things, it creates this distraction from information clarity. It, it emphasizes consumerism over, over understanding. And, and we tie that right into, like you can say, oh, well, ads aren't as big a deal anymore because you know, like you can stream your movies and you can skip the ads. Well, unless you have the Hulu basic, don't get me started. Um, but you can't, right? Because now we have embedded advertising. And I almost made a joke about it earlier because at the beginning in the first session, I was drinking a Coke and you could see me on screen. Like I was shilling for Coke as, as I was, uh, you know, talking about critical media literacy. But look at influencers, right, in social media. And, and what are they doing? They're selling. They're selling a product. They're selling themselves, sure. And, and often we don't think about what they're actually doing. Right? They, are, they are the ad. And I think that's really important to be aware of. And I don't know that, like, like we are the product, right? We hear that a lot. And, and with social media, the digital footprint, all those concepts, um, the idea that, that we're creating content for the social media platforms. Is it, is, it, is it obvious to everyone now that we're the product? And even if it is, is it, does that mean we should stop talking about it? I'll leave it there. Thanks, Ben. And uh, the, some of what you said reminds me of one of my favorite parts in the book from the last chapter where we're kind of sending off the reader with things that they can do or tools that they can use to do what they want to do. One of our guide and, guide and kind of recommendations is engage with media at a slower pace. Right. And, and I'll just this one sentence is worth reading. Um, make sure that you're engaging the media at a pace that makes sense for you rather than at a speed dictated by media producers or peer pressure. And I mentioned that not because I think it's one example of where we were able to state a really important idea in simple, clear language, but also because in the course of working on this book, collaborating with you know this group that we call the the media revolution collective i realized i wasn't engaging in social media at a pace that made sense for me i was haunted by notions of what if my friend what if what if he sees i haven't liked his post cuz i didn't actually think that picture was a very good picture <laughs> right uh I, 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 or what if i haven't liked it fast enough right um so that that's one of the insights from this book that was um helpful or important to me um just thinking about uh uh digital literacy uh one of our co-authors is not here another co-author of ours who's not here today avram anderson who's a library information science person at cal state university northridge um contributed material in the section on multiple literacies about uh, uh, algorithmic literacy, right? The importance of algorithms in shaping what we come across when we use a social media feed, when we use a search engine, et cetera, et cetera. And this notion of algorithmic gatekeeping um, that not all information it comes through these algorithms in the same way because the pe because these algorithms are ultimately the product of of human uh, labor. And so it matters, for instance, who wrote the algorithm. And we know from research that has been done on this that by and large, um, the people who uh, in kind of the tech community who are responsible for producing these algorithms are not uh, as diverse as the general population. And these algorithms often bake in uh, uh, already existing um, inequalities, mm -hmm. value discriminations and the like. Um, Avram Anderson and I have written some about how that manifests in terms of um, the, the, the accessibility of LGBTQ content online. Um, we published an article a couple of years ago in the Index on Censorship called Queer Erasure, um, 
where we looked at a week worth of of LGBTQ plus related news as provided by Google News's um, um, the Google News um, news aggregator. And what we found was that nearly 50% of the stories that week that Google News recognized as LGBTQ related stories came from conservative sources. Nearly a third of those sources were conservative Christian sources that you and I might be hard pressed to think of as regular purveyors of journalism. The result was that the Google News aggregator was actually um, promoting as, as content about LGBTQ communities and people and issues, uh, material that was in many cases homophobic and transphobic. Um, when we looked at other search engines, we found that that was not, that there were disproportions, but nowhere near as extreme as what we found on the Google News aggregator. Now we don't know, we can't know how the Google News algorithm works. It's considered uh, intellectual property by Google. Google has resisted uh, multiple efforts to uh, not to have their algorithm revealed publicly, but even to have it made available to a neutral third party to investigate uh, their algorithms for this kind of bias. So what we again, we don't know um, because um, it's considered proprietary whether homophobic and transphobic values are baked in to the algorithm or whether the algorithm is being successfully gamed by people who have transphobic and homophobic agendas. Um, but we know we but we do know on the output side that there is this is not a neutral platform. Um, and so I think algorithmic literacy as part of this broader umbrella of digital literacies must include some awareness of how algorithms increasingly shape what sort of news and information and perspective is available to us um, and what kinds of things are being promoted, what kinds of things are being filtered out, and what kinds of things are being blockaded altogether. I mentioned a moment ago this idea that there have been various efforts to try to get the Google News, to, to get Google's algorithms uh, available for third party inspection. Um, one of the things that Avram and I wrote about in this uh, Queer Erasure article uh, was a lawsuit that was uh, going at the time, a class action lawsuit against YouTube by LGBTQ content creators who were suing YouTube on the grounds that YouTube had shadow banned their content, um, had demonetized their channels, and a host of other um, a host of other forms of blockade or censorship on the basis of it being LGBTQ content. They ultimately lost that lawsuit. The judge who ruled in that case ruled that YouTube had no obligation to treat them uh, in what any number of people might consider a fair or equal way because uh, YouTube is a private corporation and it's not therefore subject to First Amendment restrictions on, um, on freedom of expression or freedom of the press. Um, so, it, I think it's an ongoing battle in terms of, of a place where activism can matter to try to expose these algorithms. Um, those battles will mostly take place in, uh, in courtrooms, I think, um, where Google is armed to the teeth and has basically bottomless pockets. But I think we can all be more algorithmically alert um, to how uh, these behind the scenes hidden filtering mechanisms um, shape what we see here and and therefore the kinds of conversations we're most likely to have. Okay. Um, I've like written some about that also in an article, I'll put the link up called The New Gatekeepers that appeared in the Marcaz Review a few years ago, where I was focused especially on um, increasingly now um, men, all the research shows that most Americans don't actively seek out news online, 
they participate, uh, they engage in what has become to be known as news snacking, which means you sort of see news incidentally as you're checking your Facebook or your Instagram uh, uh, feed, and maybe some news comes across that way. As news snacking is more and more prevalent, the, the role of digital gatekeeping by entities that are not journalistic outlets, uh, that don't think of themselves even as media outlets, um, and yet they're shaping what we see here are likely to talk about. I think that's a profound area for engagement um, and really important. And Mickey um, beat you to it, Andy. He posted okay. your uh, your article in the chat. Um, yeah. I did want to uh, just make a comment uh, about, um, Ben made a comment earlier about uh, we can't skip the ads, meaning uh, saying that now advertisement is, is embedded in all of our messaging. Um, and that made me really think about a comment uh, Maria made at the last um, um, session where she said it was never too early um, to for young people to start engaging with uh, critical media literacy. Um, and I wanna tie that back to the book in the multiple literacies um, chapter. Um, I, I contributed about um, thinking about the future of the of metaverse uh, literacies. Um, and it, it really resonated with me um, that we can't skip those ads and it's never too early. Um, because as I was developing this section, um, I worked a lot with my younger relatives to see um, how they engaged with um, the metaverse in Web 3.0. Um, and a lot of these traditional um, advertising um, um, uh, concepts and ideas are now being um, being brought into uh, the metaverse, which is the is the future of um, our web engaging. Um, and as an example, I list uh, we list in the book uh, that virtual and events and experimental marketing. Uh, and there were games like uh, um, Fortnite and uh, Roblox, where where um, young people um, have access to in-game products and and um, purchases. Um, as well as things like integrated advertisement on digital spaces like uh, billboards, um, very similar to what you would see in physical reality and on the side of buildings. Um, and then lastly, the one that was extremely prevalent was the required login creative experiences. And the example that I used uh, was from Time Magazine um, and Fortnite when they collaborated for a virtual uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, um, museum. Um, so any of the young people who engaged with that game, um, these sorts of experiences uh, were had before they could proceed. And um, when we're thinking about um, advertisement um, today, I think it's also extremely important that um, we challenge our young people to, um, to consider um, what that advertisement will look like in the future um, so that they can continue to be critical in ways that they engage um, with the media. Oh, you're, you're muted there, Andy. It's, these hour sessions go by so quickly. <laughs> um, we have about 13 minutes left till the top of the hour and the end of this session. At this point, I think we should open it up and we would welcome um, observations, dialogue, questions from um, everyone who is participating. So please join in the conversation here. And uh, thinking about... Um, the metaverse, Raina, I'm reminded of uh, Anson Stevens Bolin, who's an artist uh, based in New Mexico, who does uh, art for the Santa Fe Reporter, um, uh, independent news weekly there, uh, pointed out to M Mickey and me early in this year how um, people in Santa Fe were using Minecraft to excavate forgotten histories about the town square in in um santa fe wow. um wow. Uh, so i think this is a really interesting case of um i think this qualifies as the metaverse um notions of uh sort of 
radical alternative histories um, being being recentered via something like Minecraft. I'll put that link here in a moment. I can't multitask. Um, and then I'd see Peter saying, uh, I'm struck by how capitalism utilizes fear and dread to sell ideas. Um, the consequences of the flowers of its evil become apparent by how illness and cure are often calculated in its analytics. Case in point, the conflict of interest between buyers selling Roundup while simultaneously selling cancer cures. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, I'll just quickly, uh, before back to, back to Bayer, um, uh, Minecraft is, uh, there may be other people on the panel and session here who are better, uh, prepared to describe Minecraft, but it's a virtual world where you can build things, right? An interactive virtual world where you can build things. So in the case of the Santa Fe story that I was mentioning, people were building alternative versions of the city square in this, in the town of Santa Fe that were acknowledging like indigenous histories that are often marginalized, if not uh, uh, simply um, blockaded altogether. Um, on Bayer uh, and uh, I would say uh, one of our top 25 stories from two years ago in the 2021 yearbook was how Monsanto, which at the time had just been bought, but uh, had only previously been bought by Bayer, um, uh, Monsanto was using intel had created these so-called intelligence centers to target journalists and activists who were doing work critical of Monsanto and especially Monsanto's Roundup. Um, pesticide. Um, so these intelligence centers were designed to monitor and discredit journalists and activists. Um, they were using very uh, uh, sophisticated technologies uh, to gather and, and collect data about people. And then they were using connections with corporate media outlets to make that material public. Um, one of the things we noted so that story is available on the Project Censored website in our archive of top 25 stories. But just the point I would make about that now is a point that will be pertinent to the next panel on, on news and journalism. Um, that story was reported most powerfully by reporters at The Guardian, um, the UK-based newspaper. But we noted in our coverage of that story that ABC News, the US corporate news network, um, had covered that story, but notably in ABC's coverage of Monsanto's intelligence center targeting journalists and activists, ABC consistently emphasized the perspective of Monsanto and its parent company, Bayer. They quoted only Bayer officials, including the company's head of corporate communications and its chairman, uh, uh, chairman of the board of management. And the one exception to that we found was a statement from the PR firm Fleischmann Hillard that, of course, no surprises, represented Monsanto and Bayer. No, the ABC coverage of this story included no perspectives that might have been critical of Bayer or Monsanto for the development of its intelligence center targeting activists and journalists. So, yeah, the 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 there's perhaps uh, not much a clearer example of how corporate news reflects corporate perspectives and independent news coverage, as we found, was much more likely to, to um, treat as newsworthy. Uh, for instance, some of the sources, um, some of the journalists and activists who themselves had been targeted and how, uh, how their standpoint on this story might be very different from a buyer spokesperson or the PR flack representing the company. <laughs> uh, I want, if I may, Andy, I want to pop in with a couple of comments. Yeah. Um, first, I want to give a quick shout out to Mila Ray, who's in the audience, uh, doing some really cool work in um, algorithmic literacies. So I uh, got to see her speak at the Critical Media Liter I can't say it, Critical Media Literacy Conference of the Americas. It's getting late on the East Coast here. Um, and the second thing I want to do is just quickly, like, we're, we're covering a lot of ground in this one. 
I'm feeling a little like, whoa, my brain is in chaos. Um, but I wanted to know that I wanted to say uh, too, like last session, we were talking about critical thinking and uh, critical action. And I, I wanted to, for any educators who might be in the room, um, there's a lot of really powerful work you can do with getting students uh, thinking, questioning, engaging in, in all of these areas um, to start talking about the metaverse uh, with students and, and the, the very things that Raina laid out in her um, curriculum guide. I don't know if I'm not, that's what exactly the right phrase, but uh, the, the work that Raina has been doing. Um, I also want to throw in that the, the language of advertising itself is can be tied to classical rhetoric. And so there's a lot of ways to use this material just to take it back to the book. Um, we don't get a lot into that classical rhetoric stuff in the book, um, but it's I think it's referenced. And certainly there's a ton of really valuable stuff about um, fallacies and uh, other sort of flaws of reasoning um, in there. And I think this this concept of digital literacy is to, to getting students to really be thinking about what they're doing in the world, um, in the digital world, and how it's affecting them in their sort of uh, real world um and it's not all negative right there there is a thing that I, that I think we we don't recognize enough and we talked in the beginning a little bit about anti-social media versus social media and I think both those you know that anti-social media is a is a framing that's great for discussion and, and sort of debate um but I want to share a quick little story when when the when the pandemic you know COVID-19 hit and schools closed and we weren't allowed to sort of, you know, go and connect with other human beings. One of the one of the fascinating things that happened that I saw happening in my house, I'm sure it happened all over, was that all the activities that my older child was was currently involved in, whether it was, um, you know, playing Dungeons and Dragons, playing Magic the Gathering, hanging out with friends, um, all of these things moved online, and it's good and bad. Right. And this is the interesting thing is we Alison Butler said at the beginning of the day at one point, like media is neither good nor bad, um, but maybe both and maybe what you make of it, et cetera. But when this all went on and, and my older child, um, Elias, moved those things online, it was really fascinating to see the sort of continued connectivity, human connectivity that was achieved through this media, uh, through these digital tools. Right. And from, again, doing the gaming online. And like setting up cameras and trying to figure out how so, you know you're going to roll the dice we don't want you to cheat you know and all this kind of stuff um to these like four or five six hour marathon like video phone calls that elias would have with with the group of friends um the, the best friends and and these ongoing things it's really fascinating but then the follow-up was so elias and i talked later in the after you know i mean it's, it's an ongoing thread in our conversations actually about feeling that need to connect and, and she felt that there was this awful uh, kind of experience of being disconnected from humans during the, during the pandemic when it was going on. I don't like the word lockdown, but I guess that's what we say now. Um, and not being able to be with people was painful, isolating and, and damaging, even though the digital tools were there to provide it. And I think, I mean, I can't prove this. I don't have studies on my side right now, but I think that this has actually continued into that need to check notifications, that need to check messages that my child is still going through, you know, afterwards, like, oh, I have to check my messages. We went to see Wakanda forever last week. And on the way home, the phone came out in the car. I'm like, what are you doing? I got to check my messages. I think this is a follow through of that connectivity that was a good thing to have that digital connection during the pandemic but now I'm like put it away I think it's coming from that I'm not sure what to do with that and exactly how to connect maybe Andy will do his trick and connect it back to what we're talking about but uh I, I think it's really really interesting I think that's a really powerful uh observation though I have not figured out what exactly to do with it so that'll be my last comment tonight Raina do you want to uh uh make a last observation to wrap us wrap us up and at least for now bring this the themes of this panel to to some temporary closure uh sure um so uh so thinking about uh digital um uh, digital literacy um and advertisement um as specifically as it relates to the book um i think it's going to be extremely powerful to see the uh, ways in which young people um 
pool different ideas, projects. Um, and uh, much like Ben was saying in the last uh, session, um, become our teachers to share and collaborate um, and to give um, to be able to provide us information to do our parts to um, and I want to say uh, Dr. Baham said it best uh, to uh, to arm these young people uh, who are kind of on this fight on the front line kind of dismantling um, up, um, all of these very oppressive systems. Um, so um, thank you. Yeah, with that, please, please order your book. <laughs> All right, I think we are close to done. I see there's a flurry of activity in the uh, chat. So um, I think, Peter, I, I believe you said that you, there might be a record of the chat as well as the video recordings of the, of Indeed. the, yeah. the session. So yeah. we'll okay. be stringing all the sessions together in one long file if anybody wants it. Peter at citylights.com is my email. And thanks to everyone for hanging out with us for the duration. We really appreciate the devotion and engagement and just all the comments in the chat. We have posted links with which you can get copies of Media and Me. City Lights is definitely selling it. We are one of the only shops in the Bay Area that actually has it. Um, also, we posted links for other books. We carry quite a few, all the other project censored books and, and books by authors who've spoken you know, this weekend. Uh, our next session will be the fourth breakout room of the day, one of the final sessions. It's called News Literacy and Journalism. It begins at 5.15 Pacific time, 8.15 Eastern time. If you have any energy left, we would love to see you. I will definitely be there. I have my coffee here next to me. Uh, today's event is being brought to you by City Lights in conjunction with Project Censored and the Media Revolution Collective. Also, it's been made possible by support from the City Lights Foundation, continuing the legacy of our founder, the late Lawrence Ferlinghetti, into the future. So see you in a little bit, everyone.